So you've been coming for a while, you know that I, I was a lifeguard. In fact, I always say I am a lifeguard. And uh, I was a lifeguard for eight years. And I, my motto now is move over David Hasselhoff. Old Hoff is here, okay? You're welcome, yes. And it's funny, God's got a, a fun sense of humor because I was a lifeguard as my very first job. And now in a different season of life, I feel like I am saving lives, but through the word of God, through the gospel. So God's funny. But one thing you might not know is that I was a swim instructor. And then uh, from a swim instructor, I became a swim coach. And I was actually uh, courted by an Olympic training team here in uh, Southern California to coach six, seven, and eight-year-olds. And uh, it was my first week on the job. I was so excited. And I got to meet one of the top swimmer swimmers. His name was Kevin Kim. Kevin Kim was six years old. So tiny, and one of the cutest little Korean kids I have ever seen in my life. I mean, his mom called him Little Frog, and once he got into the water, I realized why. But he came in one of those, if you're familiar with Sanrio, Hollow Kitty, Kiro Kiro Kuropi, it's the Little Frog, and he came in at a Kiro Kiro Kuropi pool robe that when put on his hood, it had ears. It was the cutest little thing. And these Kiro Kiro Kuropi goggles, and he came in, and little six-year-old, like most children, kind of struggle in certain words, and he had a speech impediment where he couldn't say his R's. And it was the most precious thing. He was one of my favorite kids. Well, I tossed him in the pool, and I timed his 25-yard swim, and I kind of thought to myself, this kid is inordinately fast. So I had a couple other seven-year-olds and eight-year-olds hop in the pool with him. And before I knew it, Kevin Kim had beaten all these kids in the 25-meter swim. So that weekend was a swim tournament. And I was so excited because as the coach of this division, I picked my top three swimmers. And I put my money on Kevin Kim because this kid was so fast. I was so excited. Once the officiant said, on your marks, get, stop, get ready, go. Guess what? Kevin Kim is swimming in the water. And he is at least eight arms lengths ahead of any of the swimmers, including the eight-year-olds. I, if I'm honest with you, I felt like I was bad. Like, yeah, that's my kid. That's right. I taught him everything he knows. Yes, go Kevin Kim, the frog. Like we're screaming and hooting. hooting. And uh, he comes up to the wall and he does his swim flip at the wall. And he's heading back down for a 50 meter swim. Now in all of our practices, I was timing 25 meters. What I never really figured out was his time for the 50 meters. So as he is halfway through the length of the second lap, there's only two laps in this race. Get with me, because I had a little moment of panic. When all of a sudden, as he's halfway through the lane, he picks up his arms behind his head, and he rolls over on his back to float. Kevin Kim is floating on his back. And I'm looking at this in sheer panic, and I'm screaming, Kevin, swim! Swim, Kevin! And Kevin looks at me and says, I'm tired, because he couldn't pronounce his arms. And I'm looking at him and I'm like, Kevin, swim, I'm tired. And he's trying to breathe. And I'm like, keep going. Before I knew it, every single one of the swimmers in this heat had passed Kevin Kim. And he was five feet from the wall. That week, we had a conversation and I made him a promise. Kevin, if you continue to listen to me and swim your laps, you will never lose again. What I believe is that there are people in this room who you feel like Kevin. You feel like you have all the talent, all the skill, and yet you've come to a place and point in your life where you're looking up at God and you're saying, I'm tired. You wanna quit. Today, I wanna be the coach on the sidelines that's screaming at you. Sean, don't quit. Bob Peterson behind the camera that makes this video come across to people around the world. Don't you dare quit. Victoria, don't quit. The title of today's message is Too Close to Quit. Too Close to Quit. Do me a favor and turn with me in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 6. Grab your Bibles, your pens, your highlighters, your notebook. And as you are turning there, it's okay if you didn't bring one, we have a Bible for you at the Welcome Center or the scriptures are on the screen. But a value for me is that we dive into God's word and a little bit of context to make sure that we are on the same page as we dive into this narrative out of Joshua 6 is that the children of Israel were cruelly oppressed for over 400 years under the oppressive hand of Pharaoh. 
And, uh, and finally, the cries of the people made it to the ears of the Lord, and the Lord sent a rescuer by the name of Moses, who freed them from slavery and took them through to a point in a place called the Red Sea, and God miraculously opened up the Red Sea so the children of God can walk on dry ground to the other side. And they were about to go into a land that was promised to them. In fact, in Exodus 33, the Lord makes a promise to Moses. That's why this land is called the promised land. Go to the land I promised you. So they're, they're about to embark on the promised land and Moses sends out 12 spies. 12 spies representing the 12 tribes of Israel. They're on the edge of the promised land. This is everything that God has promised them. 12 spies went into the promised land and they all came back out. And two out of the 12 had the perspective and the faith to say, yes, there's giants in the land, but we are more than able to take them because our God is good. But a group of people, 10 people, put fear and doubt into the hearts of two million. If you do the odds, Joshua and Caleb were two and two million. You know what those odds are? That's one in a million. Joshua was a one in a million leader. And here, Joshua, Moses had gone to be with the Lord. And Joshua is now, after 40 years of wandering in the desert, it's about to embark on going into the promised land. There was a river separating the promised land from the desert, and this river was called the River Jordan. And Joshua put his foot into the River Jordan, and guess what? It dried up. And yet again, a generation removed, the people of God moved across dry ground over something that was once wet. Now, this is where we pick up the story, but this is wildly important because for the children of Israel and for Kevin Kim, and maybe even for you today sitting in this room, watching online, on YouTube or on the podcast, you need to hear this simple truth. If you don't envision the end, you'll give up in the middle. I never knew that Kevin Kim didn't have the endurance. He had all the skill, all the strength, all the speed, but he didn't have the endurance. Maybe you just need a reminder right now. Get a vision of your future because if you don't envision the end, you'll give up in the middle. Look at Joshua, chapter six, verse one. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because, somebody say because. because. If you brought your Bible, circle it in your Bible because we're gonna come back to this in a second. Because of the Israelites, no one went out and no one came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have, underline have, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for how many days, church? Six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times. There's a theme here. Stay with me. With the priests blowing trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. And the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up. Everyone straight in. Do you know what that is? That's a promise. God made a promise to Joshua. And in this room, much like those embarking onto promised land or promises that God has given them. This room is full of people that have been promised things by God. But just because God promised it doesn't mean that we possess it. See, in the pages of scripture, uh, the Bible is full of promises, not just for Joshua and the children of Israel, and not just for the uber holy and, and, and super righteous. No, no, God's promises are for everyone. In fact, scripture says that every promise in Christ is yes and amen. Do you know you have a promise of a future? Plans for good and not of evil to give you a future to hope as it says in Joshua? Do you know that you are not ignored or forsaken or forlorn? No, but that you are loved and chosen and seen and anointed, called to pull down strongholds, a select and royal generation. That's what First Peter tells us. There are promises made for the people of God. And you know what just breaks my heart? What, what makes me so sad, what grieves me, is how people in the church, people who claim to be followers of Jesus, are quitting, stopping short, or walking away because the promises of God feel so far for them. Now, there's no judgment. I'm not, I'm not saying, oh, you shouldn't feel those feelings. But, but I, I hear people and I talk to people, people who have said, yeah, I'm leaving the church because that person offended me. They said something to offend me. Are you going to walk away from your community because your feelings were hurt? I don't, want, I, don't want to, I don't want to say that it doesn't hurt, but can we, Matthew 18, 15, can we go to that brother and say, hey, what you said offended me, rather than walking out and peacing out in a community? Or, or what, about, what about people that are walking away from their marriage because they just feel like, I'm just, I'm just tired of the same old, same old with the same person doing the same old, same old thing with the same old, same old 
repeating the same old, same old. Or maybe you've been praying and believing. In fact, you bought a king-size bed prophesying that one day there will be someone, a spouse that you love and adore that's going to sleep in that bed with you. And that bed is still empty. Or maybe you've been praying, God, God, the, the spouse that I prayed for, now I'm praying, Lord, that you just kill them. God, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Guilty, guilty laugh, guilty laugh, yeah. Don't forsake your promise. Do you know what the children of God needed in that moment of feeling just like there is a walled city that is barred up in front of us? You know what the children of God needed? Do you know what we need today when we feel like there is walled cities in front of us? Spiritual resiliency. Spiritual resiliency. Now, I've studied the topic of grit and resilience for the last two years. I feel like I've been pregnant with this thing. I've been working on what was a project, then it turned into a concept, and then it began to embark on writing a book, all while not knowing that the word for our church this year was resilient faith. And it, it, I know it sounded like ulterior motives, but it didn't. In fact, when, uh, when we sat around and started sensing what God was speaking for our church, when resilient faith came to the top, I was like, no, 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 let's not do it. Let's not do it. Because I was working on a book on grit and resilience, and I didn't want it to seem as if there was a dovetail. But something's in the water, and God is speaking to his people. Because I'm seeing people far too strong, far too equipped, far too talented, far too fast, who are quitting, like Kevin Kim, five feet from the wall. I've come here to yell that you are grittier than you think. Well, what is grit? Grit is passion and perseverance toward a goal, despite significant obstacles. Now, if you're in here today and you are full of vigor and you're full of faith and you can scale any wall and your faith will have you leap over hurdles like there ain't a thing, guess what? We are so proud of you. I'm proud of you. Give me your secrets. Amen. But I also know that there's people in this room that just feel exhausted. You've been doing everything right. You've been loving the Lord and serving the Lord. You're serving at church. You're tithing. You're doing everything right, and yet everything feels so wrong. You are exhausted of, of honoring the Lord and trying so hard and not seeing results. You are uh, frustrated with having faith and talking to God and believing for others and yourself, and yet it feels as if your, pres your prayers have fallen on deaf ears. God, are you there? God, do you hear me? Now, there's a ton of scientific research and data uh, from uh, universities like MIT and Harvard and UC Berkeley, which is phenomenal. Uh, and I culled through all of that data, but it, it is dense. And to be honest with you, sometimes a little bit boring. But one of the things that kind of rose to the top in all these scientific studies is, is these three attributes. And I had them all rhyme with P because I am a preacher by nature and I can't help it. But I, I call these the three P's of resilience. In fact, we're going to lay these as a grid over Joshua 6, what we just read. And you will see the grit and the resilience that the children of God have. For the note takers, the three P's are resilient, of resilience are perspective. You have to have the right perspective. Ability, the ability to pivot. And lastly, perspective. What is the pain that is revealing the purpose in the midst of all of this. And do you know that these characteristics, perspective, the ability to pivot, finding purpose out of the pain, that it precludes your gender, your ethnicity, your nationality, your social economic status. You don't have to be born into poverty or be in a place of privilege. That, that resilience and grittiness and perseverance can be found for all of us. We just, know, we just need to know how to do it. And I chose this passage out of Joshua 6 because I firmly believe that we will see the children of God stay in their calling and pursue their purpose because they're gritty. And that's what I want. This series is a five-week series that is birthed out of uh, the, our word for the year, which was resilient faith. And here we are re revisiting again halfway through to remind our congregation, to remind our church, but most importantly, to remind ourselves that we may be down, but we are not out. If you want to build grit, if you want to be a gritty gangster, if you want to have a resolve to be resilient in your life, what you need to do is know how to change your perspective. You have to learn with speed to change your perspective. Well, what is perspective? Perspective is an honest assessment of our reality while maintaining hope. An honest assessment of your reality while maintaining hope. So perspective, a Christian perspective isn't like, I'm going to stick my head in the sand and put on elevation worship and just say God is good all the time and all the time God is good. I'm going to read my one-year devotional. I'm going to be a hermit. It's going to be us four and no more. Jesus paid it all. No, no, no. Everything's okay. No, no, no. That's delusion. I'm not talking about fake faith. I'm talking about an honest assessment of my life sucks right now. But I know because I'm not dead, my God is not done. 
My faith is in the Lord. He has promises that he has given me through his word that have been confirmed through other people. And God is whispering me to a land that I have not seen and have not been. And though there are giants, we will overcome because the Lord has given this land unto me. Now, for the Israelites, there was the promise. What was the promise? Land. Land. Thank you, Victoria. I hear you. Yes, 500 points for you. The promise, the children of Israel, was land. But there's a problem. And there's always a problem standing before God's promises and your possession. We don't like that part. No, I'm going to tell on us preachers. You know what us preachers love? We love preaching the promises of God because everyone gets hypey. Yeah, promises. I'm loved. I'm chosen. That's right. Me and Jesus. You know what we don't like talking about? What it costs. What your calling costs. There's always a price associated with the possession of your promise. And so many people don't want to pay the price. In the course of this series, what we want to highlight is that we are resilient people of faith who believe that though this reality is not what we want, what we like, or what we have chosen, we have hope that God is not done. There's always a problem, always a problem to your possession of the promise. For the children of Israel, it was the city of Jericho. Look at verse 1. We read it. Let's read it again. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. Ooh, that is so bad. That is so bad, it's good. Like, how bad of a people group are you that people are so scared of you, they got to lock the windows? Hide your kids, hide your wife, lock the doors, lock the windows, because the children of God are coming their way. Now, the, the people of Jericho, they had heard about the children of God, Yahweh. They say, those Jews, they say only one God, and their God freed them from 400 years of slavery. That God parted the Red Sea for them. That God dried up the Jordan River for them to walk in. Yeah, those people are now at our doorstep. That's why it was completely barred up. They were on lockdown. And the city of Jericho, according to theologians, was impossible to get into. But how many know impossible is where God begins? Impossible is the ingredient that God's like, oop, I have that. Now we can do a miracle. So maybe the thing that in your life feels so barricaded and tightly shut up isn't because it's not yours to have. But maybe, maybe, maybe the enemy knows that if you enter in and if you receive that promise, there's little going back on your faith in believing God that the promise is actualized in your life. Does that make sense? The enemy wants to keep you out from inheriting and receiving the promise that God has given you. And then God says something comical. I hear people say, the Bible is boring. You know, there's nothing funny about it. Are you kidding me? I think this is so comical. Like God's got jokes. This is irony at its best. Look at verse two. See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. Ah, time out. I'm a writer and as an author, I feel like having a conversation, <laughs> yo, Yahweh. Let me break it down about present tense. We can't use present tense and, 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 and future tense when those things don't align. But see, in the economy of God, he has the power to say, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. He's the God of all power who though the battle is waging, we know that victory is the Lord's. So the problem with verse two is verse one, that the city is tightly barred up. So what do we do when what God has said doesn't look like what we see? What do we do when the promises of God that we have received have it manifested in our midst, have it materialized in our midst? That's where I am. I know what God has spoken for my life. I know what God has spoken for this church. I know what I have seen. So what happens when what is in front of me and what I see doesn't look anything like what God has said? What do we do? When you're praying, you're fasting, you're believing, and it feels like everything that you've dreamed or felt or heard or believed is nowhere close to you. That's the moment where people quit and walk away. The enemy likes to use our problems to mess with our perspective. See, Jericho wasn't a large city, but it was a walled city. And 
the conquering of this city would set the cadence, the tempo, the pace for the other cities. Because after Jericho, there's AI. After AI, there's other cities. And so this is, this is the pace setter. It all started with Jericho. Joshua crosses the Jordan in a miraculous way and everyone is celebrating and you get into the promised land to be met by a walled city. Like, are you serious? Ah, but Josh, good old Josh, Joshua was around to see the Red Sea part. Joshua was one of the spies that went into the promised land 40 years before. Joshua was one that came back and said, though there are giants in the land, we're more than able. Joshua was there when he put his foot into the river Jordan and it split. So it doesn't matter what he sees because he believes in what God has said. And that's what I want for our church. That's what I want for our community. That's what I want for me in this season. Because what do you do when you look up and all you see is walls? The truth is, Let's tell in ourselves as Christians in this cultural moment, we are quitting because we have the wrong perspective. We look and all we see is walls. And I want you to look at whatever is staring at you in the face. And I don't want you to look at it as a sign of the thing that you're not supposed to have. I want you to look past it. I don't want you to look at the walls. I want you to keep your perspective looking up so that we, like the psalmist can says, I look to the heavens to see where my help comes from. My help comes from a maker of heaven and earth. Don't look at the wall. Keep your eyes focused on the, on the maker. And just as God promised Joshua a physical land, we have been promised spiritual blessings. But just because God promised it, doesn't mean we possess it. So the enemy will erect walls to keep us out. He will put red duct tape, yellow caution tape. He'll bar it up. He'll barricade it. And that's my story. Many of you have heard this, but girls like me, first generation American girls like me, we don't graduate high school top of our class. We don't go to college on a full ride scholarship as a Bill Gates Millennium Scholar. We don't go to grad school on a full ride scholarship and graduate grad school with the 4.0, <laughs> subtle flex, thank you Yahweh, shout out, uh, okay. But girls like me do get rejected from seminary because of my gender. What do we do when what God has said about your calling doesn't look like what you see? Maybe you're sitting in here today and you heard Caesar's message about our body being a temple and yet you've wrestled with your weight and your health your whole life. I get it, I feel you, I'll walk that same path. Maybe your doctor has said that you are genetically predisposed to obesity because your mama and her mama and her mama's mama have all been obese. And so you're thinking, this is my lot in life. When you know the spirit of God is whispering 1 Corinthians 13 over you, that your body is a temple, one to give glory to God. And if you believe that there's a purpose for your life, then you believe that you've got to take care of that body. Or maybe you come from a family where no one is married. People are either shacking up or divorcing. You're looking at generations upon generations of divorce and your family's just like, just file for divorce. Shouldn't be this hard. Just because you haven't seen it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. I want people to start looking to the heavens instead of the walls that are in front of them. Because if you don't envision the end, you'll give up in the middle. You have to have a vision for your family and a vision for your life and a vision for your wealth and a vision for your health and a vision for your academics. You have to have a vision because it's going to get hard. And if you don't envision the end, you'll give up in the middle. We're tempted to quit because we have a wrong perspective. What is it? Another thing that we need to build our grit, we progress even if we don't see progress. Is that the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable? No, church, I'm gonna say it again, say it again. You guys, that's funny. I'm giving you my best today, okay? <laughs> please laugh, please laugh. We progress even without the progress. See, in Newton's third law of motion, it says for every reaction, for every action, there's an equal reaction. Meaning I step on the gas pedal, the car goes forward. I step on the brake, the car stops. And as a, as a action-oriented community and culture, we do something for God, God does something for me. Now, I want to break this down in the text to see how that is not the case, as we see for the children of Israel. And I want us to imagine being there in the pages of scripture. God has a conference call with Joshua and he's like, hello, Josh, this is the assignment. It's not going to look like anything you've ever seen before, but we're going to make it through. Look at verse three. 
March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for how many days? Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in the front of the ark, and on the seventh day, march around the city seven times with priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. Hmm. That's the action plan. Now for me, I'm all about motivation. I'm all about goal setting. Like I am so neurotic. I love things super organized. I'm the person who has a to-do list for my to-do list. In fact, in fact, I'm the crazy person that writes things on my to-do list that I've already done. Can I get a witness? Anyone else in here struggling with OCD? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Because we love the power of saying, I have accomplished that, even though it's already done. Yes. Now, I believe that the children of God, there's probably some crazy people in there like me, like Dr. Cynthia de Alba, who were just like, wait a minute, I want to see progress. What's going on here, God? Okay. So Joshua, I remember, I imagine Joshua thinking, okay, so we're going to march around the city walls and, and then... God will give us a sign that victory draws near. A brick will buckle from the wall. Maybe there'll be a shake, rattle, and a roll. We'll get some movement. People will be, ooh, ah, Yahweh. That's not what happens. In the economy of God, it doesn't work that way. See, we have our plans. We have our goals. And then the Lord shouts, pivot. You know a characteristic of gritty people? We have plans. But we also have a deep ability to pivot. A hallmark of gritty people are people that say, I've been trying to do it this way and it's not working, so I have to find another way. If I can't scale the wall, I've got to find a way to get around it. This is the third thing to build our grit and resilience. Gritty people have the ability to pivot. And isn't that the way life operates sometimes? God gives us a game plan. And we are like, are you sure? Maybe for you, you had a job in corporate America and you had the C-suite and you had power naps and power lunches and you wore a power suit and you used PowerPoint presentations and all of a sudden the Lord has called you to parent and you're changing 75 baby diapers and the Lord is like, pivot. Maybe you uh, have a wonderful job and you're making lots of money, but there's this, this, this gnawing nag at your heart that the Lord is calling you to ministry and you don't understand it because you're like, I'm making so much money here and I'm providing for my family and you want me to take a pay cut and, and, and serve your people and be underappreciated because church people honestly are hard to deal with sometimes. Yeah, the Lord shouting, pivot. Maybe you've been dating somebody for three years. You might even be engaged and you're like, okay, this is the person I'm gonna marry. And the Lord is gently whispering to you, that's not your partner. And you're confused and you're saying, but we've been dating for so long and I thought I was gonna marry him. The Lord is shouting, pivot. And this is how things work because you're going to have to walk by faith, not by sight. What happens when what you see doesn't look like what God has said? Now, if you've been around Vacation Bible School or this church, you know how this story ends. They march around the wall once a day for six days. And on the seventh day, they march around seven times and the walls come tumbling down. It's a victory. People celebrate. There's high fives. There's chest bumps. There's fist bumps. I mean, it's a party. But I find it significant that the number six in the Bible represents something. Does any word nerd in here know the biblical number or significance for the number six and what it signifies in the Bible? Man, that's right. All the Bible scholars are in this service. Well done. Yeah, six represents the number of man. So they walked six days, the number of, of man, and nothing changed. So here's what I want us to do. I want us to march even when it doesn't make sense. Will you do what God has asked you to do even if it doesn't work out the way that you want it to work out? Will you march when nothing makes sense. See, this message is for someone who has lost their perspective. This message is for someone who, who knows that the Lord is calling them to pivot. This message is for someone who has grown weary because their progress isn't obvious. I want you to know that just because your progress isn't obvious doesn't mean your faith isn't working. It means you gotta keep on moving. Even when bricks don't fall and even when windows don't break. And, and, you, and you know what we see here from the children of Israel? It's obedience. They didn't get a sign that their faith was working. They just simply obeyed. Because maybe in the circling, 
God is more concerned about what is going on internally than what is going on externally. Maybe God cares more about what the process and the act is doing to you than the way you feel about what is going on. Look at what Joshua tells his people in verse 8. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying seven trumpets before the Lord went forward blowing their trumpets and the Ark of the Lord's Covenant followed them. The Ark of the Covenant is, is, is represented the presence of God. And I just want to let you know here at TFHOC, we don't want to move without the presence of God. Why do we worship? Why do we want you to show up on time? Why do we want you to get in a community group? Because, because together the presence of God is where two or three are gathered. There God is. We worship God. We extol his name. We fight for the presence of God just like they did walking around Jericho. Verse 9, the armed guards marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets. And the rear guard followed the ark. All this time the trumpets were sounding. But Joshua had commanded the army, do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voices. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. Sometimes the best strategy is to shut up and march. Because the more that you talk about it, the more likely you are to talk yourself out of it. Notice that Joshua didn't tell his leaders how long they would have to march. God told Joshua, you're going to do this for six days. But we just read right now, Joshua didn't give him a roadmap. No, Joshua went out that first day and he knew that it was going to be six, but the people of God didn't. Look at verse 11. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once. Then the army returned to camp and spent night there. Now, this is speculation here, but, but I believe as the children of God were walking around the walls of Jericho, that the people of Jericho, maybe on day one, they felt like, oh no, the children of Israel are laying out a map and seeing our weak points of entry. They're building a game plan. But then on day two, they're like, they're still walking around. This is odd. Then day three, those people are straight crazy. What do they think we're going to do? Just march us to death? Then maybe day four, they start hurling rocks and try to aggravate the children of Israel. But by day five they're now hurling insults let me tell you something child of God there will be people who will look at you and laugh they will hurl insults they will wonder what you're doing and I'm begging you by the mercies of Christ not to listen to them not to let them badger you or pull you off of task I'm going to ask you by the mercies of Jesus Christ to shut up and march do nothing do nothing do nothing until the Lord tells you to do it. Look at verse 12. Joshua got up early the next morning and the priests took the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them and the rear guard followed the ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. On the second day, they marched around the city once returned to camp. They did this for how many days? And what does six represent? Yes, they had no idea how many days they were going to have to do this. And isn't that just like life? I mean, it would be nice. It would be nice if you walk into your chemo appointment, the doctor says, after these three treatments of chemo, you will be cancer free. Wouldn't that be awesome? You go into your counseling session, your therapist is like, five more sessions and you are problem free. You go meet with your pastor and you're like, three more sessions of marital counseling and you will be perfect. Like, wouldn't that be awesome? Okay, you all came with your church faces. Thank you. Is that just me? No. Okay, great. Wouldn't it be nice to know, Kevin, you're five feet from the wall. Wouldn't that feel real good? Yeah. But see, when you're on the third lap and you are saying, God, I'm still addicted to weed. I love you, but I, I, I can't give it up. We're on your fourth lap and you're saying, God, I'm making the payments on my credit card. But this debt is so overwhelming. I'm always going to be debt free. When you're on day five and you're still bickering with your spouse thinking this is going to end in something that I don't even want to say. What do you do then? What do you do then? Shut up and march. Don't say anything. We give up because we lose perspective. We give up because we don't know how to pivot. We give up because we don't think that our progress is obvious. So this is what we need to do. We need to find purpose in the pain. We need to find purpose in our pain. This doesn't make sense, God. My reality isn't what I want or like, but God. But you, God, but you. 
Paul speaks about running our race. Paul speaks about running our race or in Kevin Kim's situation, swimming his race. And Paul says to run your race and not quit. And I'm screaming at Kevin Kim in the same way that I'm screaming at you and saying, you're too close to quit. It's just one more lap. It's one more sacrifice. It's one more yes. It's one more act of obedience. It's one more I surrender my life to God. It's just one more time. Because though you might be exhausted, this could be your sixth lap. And you might not even know it. You might be so close to the wall and not even know it. You might be so close to freedom and not even know it. You might be so close to redemption redemption and not even know it. You might be so close to financial freedom and not even know it. You might be so close to restoration and not even know it. You might be so close to salvation and not even know it. You might be so close, so don't quit. That's the story of Florence Chadwick, a woman from San Diego, California, who in her era and her time during the 1950s and 60s was an incredible athlete that people grossly underestimated until she became the first person, not the first woman, the first person to swim both sides of the English Channel. She had heard about uh, someone who had swam from the shores of California to the island of Catalina and she said, I wanna do that. So much training and practice had went in and the day came for the, the race and her mom and her coaches were in a, a dinghy that were swimming alongside of her to keep out for danger, sharks, and encourage her with words of encouragement. 16 miles into the 26 miles that it takes from California to Catalina, there was a dense, heavy fog that came over the California ocean, if you're familiar with it. This dense fog is disorienting. She lost her sense of direction. She's fatigued and exhausted, but she kept swimming and swimming and swimming until she got to a point through tears and exhaustion. She said, I quit. I don't know where I'm at and I can't go on. They pulled her into the lifeboat and as the fog dissipated, she was gutted to see that she was one mile from the shore of Catalina. She was weeping, devastated, but she goes home and she begins to swim again, lap after lap after lap after lap after lap. And the very next year, she says she's gonna to swim to Catalina. So she set out to sea with the lifeboat with her mom and her coaches, looking out for sharks and other things of danger while encouraging her to keep going. And there was a thick, dense, heavy fog that rolled over the water. Except she told herself, I've been here before. I know what this feels like. So swim and swim and swim and swim until her feet touched the shores of Catalina two hours faster than the only man who had ever completed it because this is what happens when grit don't quit. Wouldn't it be a shame if you gave up now? Wouldn't it be a shame if you gave up right now? Wouldn't it be a shame if you were one lap away from God doing the impossible? See, because six is the number of man, but do you know what the number seven is? Oh, seven is the number of completion and perfection what man could not do for six days God did in seven and I want the skeptic and the doubter who's sitting in here saying well how do I know I'm on the sixth day I'm tired and you're just gonna keep me make walking act like every day is your sixth day and one day it will be
okay? I want us to be a congregation where we march and we march and we march. And the moment that God says, give me a shout of victory, we stand to our feet and we say, the God who made us a promise is faithful to complete it. So church, I'm gonna let you know where we're going. We have never done this in TFHOC history, but I firmly believe it's in the Bible. I wanna be scriptural, I wanna be biblical. I've never done this in our church before, but this is what we're going to do. When I say give God a shout of victory, we are gonna shout so loud that the demons in hell begin to cower, that, that Satan himself begins to shiver and say the people of God are coming up against us. They're bringing light into dark places. There is a confidence in them that it doesn't matter what wall is in front of them. It doesn't matter what sin they're currently in. It doesn't matter their fear, their doubt. It doesn't matter the divorce that they're in. It doesn't matter their credit card debt. It doesn't matter their lack of education. It doesn't matter what they don't have because they serve a God who has gone before them and the God who promises faithful. So the Father's House Orange County, can we give a shout of victory because the battle belongs to the Lord. Oh, no, no, give a shout of victory. Let the demons cower because we serve a God who is strong. So we're gonna worship God in spirit and truth because the victory belongs to the Lord.